Wow, what do you know? It's time for the Pocket Knife Show. Hey, it's Mike on the mic again for another episode of the Pocket Knife Podcast. Running coast to coast across the United States seems like an impossible task, doesn't it? Add a time limit to that deed, say 40 days, and the probability of accomplishing such a feat decreases dramatically. Who could do such a thing? Only someone fanatically committed to the goal, someone who's trained to do it, prepped for the logistical nightmares, willing to suffer, and who is supported by friends and family and strangers along the way. About two weeks ago, I got a text from a cross-country parent. She wanted me to know a guy, Paul Johnson, was attempting to run across the continent, and he was nearing town. Her brother, who had been following Paul's progress for a week or so, sent her a link to his tracking data, and she forwarded that link to me. I immediately decided I'd find a way to run with Paul, if only for a few miles. I visited his site and learned what it took to run with him. Stay beside or behind him. Talk if you want, but don't demand a response. Bring your own food and gear. Paul sets the pace. Simple enough. Having paced other ultra runners, everything made sense to me. Throughout that day, a cold and wintry windy day in Kansas, I kept watching Paul's progress. It was much slower than expected. In fact, I had calculated by what he said on the page that he'd be in Pratt by 3 o'clock, and he wasn't even to Cullison, 10 miles to the west by that time. I went to track practice, coached my distance runners, then checked Paul's location again at 5 o'clock. He still wasn't to Cullison. Earlier in the day, I'd worked out the logistics for getting to Paul and getting back to Pratt. The cross-country mom who sent me the link took me to where Paul was. He ran up to the location, and it was rest time. I didn't want to keep my ride waiting, so I asked some others who were running with Paul if I could sit with them in their warm car until Paul was moving again. They agreed to this arrangement, so I sent my ride away and enjoyed connecting with my new friends from Hutchinson and Hayes, both cities in Kansas. Finally, Paul stepped out to run again, and we joined him. Because of the brutal conditions, Paul wasn't really running that day. He was walking. Walking fast, but still walking. It was easy enough to keep up, but it wasn't slow. This was a fast, fast walk. Eventually, all the Hutchinson and Hayes horde hopped in their vehicles and drove away. It was just Paul and me on the road. We had a great conversation about EMS work. We'd both been EMTs and about distance running and pacing in general. It was during this stretch that I learned Paul had abandoned his attempt to break the transcon record. He spoke of the damage done to his body in the desert in a sandstorm, how he'd had difficulty breathing for days after that. I was sad for him, but happy he was still on the move. When Paul was done with that day, I caught a ride into Pratt, and that was that. The next day, I drove out to say hi again and set up Paul's tracking site on my computer so I could monitor his progress across Kansas and on into other states. As I record, Paul is in Illinois and on track to complete his cross-country run in 50-ish days. Still an amazing feat, but there is a bit of controversy surrounding Paul's run in the distance running community. He's been criticized by some for abandoning the world record goal too early. The fiasco in the desert? That was on day four. And he announced the next day, or maybe it was even that day, that he was abandoning his 40-day goal. He would be focusing on fundraising for Team RWB instead. His detractors belittled Paul for quickly giving up. They wondered out loud if he'd ever really thought he could actually set a world record. I knew nothing of this while running with Paul. I enjoyed my time with him and understood why he'd stopped pursuing the record. Weird things happen when you set out to do daunting deeds. Paul was still knocking out mostly 60 to 65 mile days. No small thing when you're doing it day after day after day. Paul, I'm talking about the Apostle now, had a similar commitment to moving forward despite hardship and criticism. Some, it seems, questioned his apostleship, wondered if he was really all that. Their criticism stung, but... Paul kept moving forward. 
Listen to what he writes to the church in Corinth in his second letter to them. This is 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches." Some may have questioned Paul's credentials. Others may have doubted his abilities. Paul, like Paul the runner, ignored all the hubbub. He endured hardship and kept doing what God gave him to do. People may criticize the way you follow Jesus. They may not like the way that you talk about him or the way you serve him or the ideas you hold about him. Check what they're saying with God, praying about it, seeking direction from the Spirit, and then keep moving forward, walking in step with the Spirit, not in step with the critics. Trust God, and like Paul, follow Jesus. Oh no, it's sad I know we've come to the end of the show. See you next time.